this video, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the jab. Hey everyone, this is Coach Keith Kepner. This video, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the jab, also known as mastering the jab, but we're going to go into the anatomy of it, all the deep uh, nuanced points about it. That is obviously why most people are here on this channel for serious boxing people, not just people who are fans of boxing. Okay. This video was inspired by James Johnson. He has an Instagram channel, Pad Work by James, and I asked him for some thoughts and ideas, and he gave me one that many, and this was one of them. And I was like, man, you know what? It's easy with something as basic as the jab to not talk about it. I'm sure there's plenty of videos done about it, but I'm going to do my best to make this the best video. Maybe. Okay, that's up to you to decide, but I'm going to make an attempt. And we should respect anyone who attempts, uh, even if they fail while failing greatly, because I shall never be with those cold and timid souls that know neither victory nor defeat. And may you be the same. All right, let's jump into it. The anatomy of the jab. By the way, make sure you stick around to the end where I'm going to give you six jab exercises that you will use to make you be more fast, powerful, everything, even have more endurance with it. So make sure you stick around for that because that will be at the very end. Also, before we get going, make sure most of you guys watching have not subscribed. Make sure you like the video, join, become level two. I'll review your sparring, training footage, fight footage. I'm only accepting 10 more people because I realized just as far as the amount of time that I have between running a, a, running a large gym business as well as uh, working with fighters and everything else that I want to make sure I don't, I don't slack and uh, not get back to people as quickly as I should and could uh, with feedback videos just like this on their sparring and fights to help them progress. Uh, subscribe to the channel. Also, consider buying me a cup of coffee. I live off of coffee. Coffee is my love, love language. Uh, you can do that by doing a super thanks. So at the bottom of the video, there's a, th a thanks there, right there, right there, boom. Okay. Some people have dropped five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks. Pretty awesome. And it's a great way to support the channel just with a quick little tip and a cup of coffee for Coach Keith. All right. So jab theory. Let's talk about the theory of it first before we go into all the rubber to the road concepts. So the jab, as we all know, is the most important punch in boxing. That's something that people will repeat verbatim and not be able to tell you. Now, am I going to tell you all the reasons the most important punch? I might not. I might not because there are so, so, so many. Right now, my mind is gushing with them. All right. But let's divide them into three categories on why the jab is the most important punch in, dare I say, all of combat sports. Number one, it's the safest. Think about it. Any other punch you throw is going to be more committal. Now, of course, you could throw any punch completely undercommitted and passive, and in theory, not open yourself up, possibly, but also in theory, open yourself up because of throwing uncommitted punches, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the jab, in its very nature, because you throw it from a, your stance without a rotation, it's not a hook, so therefore there's not a follow-through that happens, uh, it is going to be the least committed punch, the safest punch because of that, but also create the least amount of openings contrasted with probably just about every other punch there is. Now, it's the fastest punch right? From the pure dynamics of your stance, because your jab in boxing world, because sometimes people will call a jab in other worlds, the, the rear hand straight. I've, I've heard this, but in the legitimate boxing realm, the jab is the straight lead hand 
<laughs> and that's it. So it's the fastest, right? Because your lead is closest to your opponent, and the quickest way to get there is a straight line. Granted, you could make an argument for a hook, possibly like a short hook being faster from different ranges or, or just as fast. But nevertheless, when in doubt, you need to pull that jab out and use it. Now, the last thing, and this is perhaps one of the most important things, because with amateur fighters, pro fighters, they'll run into trouble. They'll throw their punches. It will cost some energy. No matter how correctly you throw your punches, which in my uh, belief, the more correct you do it, the, the least energy it, it consumes. But no matter how optimum you throw the punches, you are going to burn the least amount of energy with that jab because you're not rotating the body as much, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just an extension of the arm, which really doesn't take that much energy. Now, granted, there's a fatigue factor that builds in. There's, there's also different anatomical factors that go into the jab that uh, can make it more fatiguing than it needs to be. And we will talk about that a little bit later and throughout this entire video. All right. Now, as Chuck Bodak would say, my dad's mentor, who we teach the boxing lineage of, Chuck worked with over 50 world champions, including he was the Olympic coach for Muhammad Ali. And he was my father's mentor as a coach, and then my father was my mentor as a coach. Chuck would say the jab is like a, it's like a cane or a stick to the blind man because it tells you your range. It tells you if you're too close, perhaps. It also tells you when you're too far away. It tells you when you're just right. I'm a big believer. And like with so many things, if we, if we only did the few simple things that we know, we would be successful, you know, as, as people, but as fighters. And I'm reminded in talking about this, about how, you know, this is something that I could definitely preach more with my boxers of the idea of putting out that jab, snapping it, and it comes up a couple inches short. We know we're a couple inches out. It connects, getting that clean right hand right off of it or a hook off of it, whatever it is. But therefore, having that ability to measure distance with that jab, to line up things with that jab is so important. And the more you make that jab your, your spotter, in a sense, like you're a sniper uh, or, your, or your cane, your feeler, uh, the, the better you're going to be. And it's going to control heads and do many more things than this that we're going to talk about. But I'm a big believer that the more we can develop the ability to have our jab be our third eye, the better we'll be. All right, don't always throw away your jab. That's something I say a lot because, and I've had to, to break a lot of my guys of it, because you'll see, and this is why the jab is so great, is because you can throw it away, right? And you can throw away any punch, obviously, but it's the safest punch to throw away. And <clears throat> you see a lot of high-level guys, you know, pawing out their jab, just, you know, lightly touching it, et cetera, and, you know, doing, quote, throwaway jabs. But if all you have is throwaway jabs, which I've seen guys that are, you know, zero to 10 fights, sometimes even more, but, you know, definitely in the zero to 10 fight range, which you might be in that range right now if you're watching this uh, or coaching someone that is, they'll get stuck in this pattern of, of having a ineffective jab, a throwaway jab. And that leads a lot of openings. It invites somebody to counter the jab. Because if your jab is always a throwaway jab, you know, or at least 90% of the times is a throwaway jab, that's going to take away a lot of its effectiveness. And then you're going to stop believing in the power of the jab. Versus if you learn how to develop a good jab, like we're going to talk about today, that has the pop on it that is concerning to somebody, then all of a sudden that jab is a lot harder to counter because now, you're wor now they're worried about it. Now it's something that is in their arena of concern. And so therefore, now it's going to set up things better. It's going to keep you safer. It's going to deter them more because as well, the jab can be a, a great defensive tool uh, and, and shut down a lot of punches uh, by the very nature of how it's thrown. Control people's heads, snap it back as they're throwing a punch, therefore taking off the steam or the entire punch that someone might throw at you. But if all you do is throwaways, 
someone will throw you away. Now, have your seatbelt on when you jab, right? So often, we don't realize how dangerous things are. We don't wear a seatbelt where it's a simple thing you can do, right? And that doesn't mean you, you drive your car more dangerously now that you're wearing a seatbelt, but it's that last little extra prevention. So what do I mean by wearing a seatbelt with a jab? What I, mean by, what I mean by this is putting the chin behind the lead shoulder as you jab, and of course, giving your rear hand a job, right? So the rear hand job is maybe to be on the side of the face, depending what your style is or, or who you're fighting, or might be in front of the face. But it's employed. It's not off in the wilderness, down, low, or going back, or whatever. And to be clear, you can see many, many, many fighters have their chin up, not behind the shoulder, and their rear hand flopping out in the wind. <laughs> and uh, so to be clear with all these things, like you guys know with my content, I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth is, in boxing, you can do almost anything. But what I'm about is what's going to be the highest reward. You can drive a car for years, not wearing a seatbelt, speeding, <laughs> doing, you know, drinking, <laughs> whatever, and uh, or not paying attention to the road. You can do that for years and be fine, but it only takes one time. And I'd hate for that one time to be when you're in a, a match of consequence, and now you're up that creek without a paddle. All right. So first off is, like I said, chin behind the shoulder, having the rear hand being employed, but then also being able to have a broad variety of defense as you jab. Right, so we're jabbing and catching, jabbing and blocking. We can block the vast majority of punches with our rear hand. So be able to do that. Don't rely on, I see a lot of guys, they'll build up funky habits of blocking punches with their lead hand, like the majority of punches with their lead hand, including the opponent's, you know, same hand. So if you're both right-handers, they'll block their opponent's left-hand punches like jabs with their lead hand. And they just, they shut down their own jab. Uh, and then they leave themselves open for other punches. So being able to work what I believe in the theory of boxing that I teach, the rear hand should do the majority of the defense, right? And there's a reason for this. If you look at the vast majority of world champions, the vast majority, great question I ask kind of newer people because they'll, they'll get this funky. So a lot of newer people will put their lead hand up high and their rear hand a little bit lower. Again, if you look at the vast majority of champions, your rear hand is a little bit higher. Your lead hand is a little bit lower because the rear hand does the majority of the defense. Now, don't only throw single jabs. Again, these are all things that are going to make you unbelievers of the importance of the jab and, and rob you of your true potential and your ability with the jab. You're shooting singles out there, one jab at a time. Again, just like the throwaway jab, you're making your jab Inept. And I talk about a multi-jab strategy uh, in a big multi-jab strategy video. You should check it out. I'll, I'll try to remember to put it down in the description below. But when we're putting only one punch out there, it makes it very easy for your opponent to know, okay, he's going to lead with that punch, let's say, and there's not going to be anything else after it. You know, even if you do throw other punches afterwards, they know that that's only one of that punch, one of the jab, the most important punch of boxing. So then, since there's only one of them, let me counter that one, or let me counter right after it, right? And that's, that's a very important thing. And I've even seen this with, let's say we try to fix this with a simple double jab answer. A lot of times that's effective. A lot of times that's enough of a variance with a single and a double that it throws people the hell off at any level of boxing, including world-class status. But sometimes, even at lower class status, the double jab becomes predictable, and they know it's a double. They know it's a double. They know it's a double, right? And they counter that. So mixing it up, singles, doubles, triples, feints, and then also we're going to talk about a little bit later other things with the jab that are essential to know and to understand. All right, but so you might be one of those guys that you're out there, you're jabbing, and you're like, man, every time I jab, I get, I get nailed. I know that's been my experience from time to time. But the answer is, let's do multi-jab. And watch that whole multi-jab video to get more nuance on that. Now, a great question. Where do you jab? That's something that's funny. 
a lot of people don't necessarily think about that question unless you've been in round boxing for a long time and really thought about it. Where do you jab? Well, you jab people's head, right? Well, let's talk more specifically about the places we're going to jab and why we're going to jab there, okay? So the first thing, the number one thing, is we're going to jab the jaw. The jaw is the button in boxing, right? Um, I'd much rather just about take a punch anywhere else on my head that's legal, right? I don't want to get hit in the back of the head. But anywhere else that's legal, the tip of the jaw, you know, when you're, if it's like this, like I am right now talking to you, with a punch that even just has a moderate amount of snap on it, <clears throat> is very, very disturbing. It gives you that, that buzz feeling, which is not the feeling that I want to have when I'm boxing. And it's, not, and it's a sign that your brain is having some trouble. So going for that jaw. And then there's also benefits to that as well because uh, it's, gonna, it's a little bit more of the center mass of the person and then of the head. So if you're aiming for their jaw and they bob down a little bit, you're still going to get their forehead. All right? So going for the soft tissues of the face, or as my dad would say, the mush. But the nose, the jaw, all these softer areas, it's going to be better on your hands and everything else, particularly when you're fighting pro. But uh, it's also going to cause more damage and, uh, and hurt them more as well. Because you can drop people with a jab. I've done it. And of course, many, many people have done it. All right. Now, the next one, the shoulders and the chest. Somebody's moving their head a lot. Easy answer. A lot of you guys know it. Aim for the chest, right? Because that's the broader part of the body and uh, the chest and the shoulders. Right, so that alone is the answer to shutting down head movement most of the time. You can also, if you've got the good reflexes for it, and should be able to develop the skill to do it, to catch somebody if they're kind of tick talking side to side, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But easy, easy answer, right? Because it's all about what's the easiest answer to a complex problem. It's just to aim for the shoulders and the chest, and that will shut them down quite a bit, and they'll stop moving their head so much. And then, now they stop moving their head, you can line up the other shots you want. But at the very least, you won't be missing. Let's say you always aim for the forehead and someone's moving the, their head, or you're aiming just for the, the mid of the face, like where the eyes are, then you're playing right into what they want you to do. Let's not do what our opponent wants us to do. Let's do what we want to do. Now, a few more nuances with this. The chest is primarily to shut down the, uh, the head movement. And it's remarkable. You know, I've, had, I've had so many guys do this at so many different levels. Um, and at so many levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, that it will shut down head movement. It will make most people forget that you're aiming that jab for their face. And then it lines up the headshot right away. Now, let's talk about why, like, the, the thoughts of the jab and the two different shoulders, all right? So you jab that lead shoulder, let's say. Then you actually open them up a little bit for the right hand, right? You move them open a little bit, that clears a path sometimes for that right hand. It also can wear out the shoulder if you're fighting multiple rounds like as a pro fighter. Uh, and it can also shut down the jab to a degree. Now be aware though, that there's some, some downside to this, all right? And we'll talk about that. You can jab the rear shoulder and it, it ends up being, you know, the hand. And we'll, we'll, jump about, we'll talk about that on, on the next slide. All right, so let's talk about jabbing the hands, because that's where we're going to talk about this specific nuances of different openings. So we're jabbing the lead hand, let's say. I've had a lot of guys do this just naturally, because they see other people do it, or they, they feel some effectiveness in it. And it is a good way to shut down a jab. But the challenge is, is that if that is your modus operandi, then you open up a clear path for their right hand if you're fighting an orthodox fighter. Now granted, if you're fighting a same stance fighter, uh, sorry, an opposite stance fighter, a mirror stance fighter, you know, orthodox versus southpaw, then, you know, jabbing their lead arm, that just is going to happen, right? So you got to find pathways over and under it. But when we're same stance and we're jabbing their lead hand, we're crossing over with that jab. And now there's a very clear path for a right hand or a two to come over. And I, I've seen it happen too much. So if someone's jabbing your lead hand, remember that as well as the answer. Because anything that, that uh, can be used against you will be used against you but you should use that against them with that knowledge. Now, jabbing the rear hand or the rear shoulder, whichever one's more available, that's going to shut down right-hand counters, 
uh, in a lot of ways because you're just you're stuffing that hand. You can hyperflex the elbows back or the elbow back, right? You do a stiff jab on that. It can hurt someone's elbow. I've had, I've had people do it. I've had people experience it. Uh, and then it can clear a pathway for a jab because, again, that jab is going to that hand. People get stuck believing that hand is now the target, like they're holding mitts. And then it's the face, right? It's a beautiful thing. And that's a strategy to be aware of and to use that you can lull people into hitting your, your hands a little bit and it will get them to just aim at that range and in those areas. And then that makes you pretty, pretty, uh, pretty safe. And that's why when you do drills and things like that, you have to be deadly sure that you are not aiming for hands because you're building the habit within yourself to punch hands, which is not the sport of boxing. That's practicing to miss the goal, to miss the hoop, you know, to, to miss the target, right? So you have to make sure that we bust through the guard with our punches. Don't go to the guard, go through the guard, because oftentimes that happens as well with the hands, because we'll hit hands and we feel like that is the target. That's not the target. This is the target. The body is the target. We have to bust through that. And if your defense is built in a fashion where you feel like that is where they're going to and they're not going through, you have a, a rude awakening when someone actually punches through your guard and gets you. All right. Now, the sides. Let's talk about that. That's another just great nuanced area of aiming. So first off, let's say you're jabbing to the lead side of their face, right? If you're same stance, then you're going to probably be lining them up for a right hand, right? You're jabbing off to that lead side. It's going to get them leaning over to their rear side, which opens up a clear pathway for your right hand. You know where they're going to be. Also, it can discourage them from slipping that way, let's say, if they have the habit of doing so. If I feel punches sliding around, sliding on that side of my face or a little bit on that side, or every time I go over there, the punch is right there to meet me, I don't want to go over there anymore. Now, a similar thing comes for jabbing the rear side. We're jabbing the rear side. It can lean them a little bit more into maybe a rear uppercut shot if they're the same stance as us, or again, a two that's just angled over there a little bit, as well as just another jab, right? Uh, and then also jabbing above. Now, we can jab either, like I'm showing here, kind of the top of the head area, and that's going to dump them into any punch we want down there, but specifically maybe an uppercut. Now, also, you might also sometimes jab the forehead, okay? Now, specifically with helmets, like in amateur boxing, you can jab that helmet all day long, and you're not going to ever, 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 ever have a problem, all right? But when you're pro and you jab someone in the forehead hard and they have a hard head, you can hurt your hand. So you want to minimize jabbing the forehead as hard as you can most of the time, unless you just got just crazy strong hands or whatnot. Uh, and, but, we can, but one benefit, though, of jabbing that forehead is now you're making them have to pick up their guard higher or they'll start dropping down to go under it if they're smart. Uh, but also think about think in terms of leverage, right? If you jab me here, let's say we're amateur, you jab me here, it can snap my head, absolutely, 100%. If my chin is down, it'll happen less. But if you jab my forehead, it'll snap my head a little bit more. It makes it a little bit more clear that a punch is landing. And then also, remember, if we control the head, we control the body. That applies to any type of combat, sport, or martial art. If you control that head, snap it up, it opens up other available options, right? And it makes it harder for them to do what they want to do to you. Now, the jab to the body. Bam. Right there in the stomach. You could go for the sternum as well. And you could go for the, the floating rib, like as they jab. But that jab for the body, great punch to use. Something I didn't use enough, but a lot of taller, shorter, and mid-sized fighters use this effectively. And it's a great way to, to disrupt someone's breathing. And also, there's just an open pathway for it when you're same stance. Just like how when you're fighting an opposite stance fighter, there's an open pathway for your two to the body. Wide open for that powerful two rear hand. But there's a wide open spot. Let's try to step with that jab so we can put maximum power on it. Let's make sure we slip the head offline for extra safety. And then for even more safety, 
The danger of jabbing to the body is the right hand or the rear hand come over the top, all right? So how do we resolve that issue and that challenge? Well, one is obviously starting with jabs up top, perhaps, not letting them know when we're going to jab for that body or following up the jab of the body with a quick punch up top, like a right hand, a two, or even a three up top. Uh, so mixing in that variety is enough to create uncertainty to make them less likely to want to counter or to feel certain about their counter. But also, we can just cross catch or cross block that shot as we jab for the body. Be ready for it. If you're a shorter guy like I was, people will do this punch to you even when you jab them for the head. And you need to be able to have an answer besides just head movement. All right? Head movement can be an answer, but it can't be your only answer. We need options. Now, three ways to produce power with your jab. Again, to have an effective jab. Pro boxing, which is again, even though the vast majority of people I coach are amateur boxers, but whenever we're boxing, I think the, the pinnacle of boxing, in my personal opinion, and in the philosophy I was raised, is pro boxing. Pro boxing is scored on clean, effective punches. Effective means powerful. Clean means it's not sliding off or, you know, skipping off of someone. It's, it lands nice and flush. Uh, clean, effective punches. So effective is power. We have to know how to have effective, powerful punches, including our jab. And the less your jab has power, that's one more weapon people don't need to worry about, which is the most important weapon. And you're going to have more of a tough time than you need to. All right. Yes, a fast jab is excellent and important, but a powerful jab is very helpful. Now, before we jump into that, though, if you haven't yet already, you know, consider buying me a cup of coffee, drop down to that super thanks, whether it's 20 bucks, 10 bucks, five bucks, coffee's getting expensive and it helps keep me going to help me make more videos. Thanks for the support, guys. All right. So first off, we're jumping this into, into three categories for how to make power with a jab. So the first category, I have this divided into two different points. And I, I, I'm, point number one is, is a few different things together, but I feel like they're not different enough to make them their own category or own sub point. So you have the turnover, the whip, and the shoulder snap. All right. So you have the turnover of the punch at the end, right? That creates more velocity. Uh, some, I, I think it's, Similar to what like some old school people, like I think Jack Doc Dempsey talks about in his book about the corkscrew punch or whatever, but that turnover at the end creates that extra force and power that also theoretically, I think, can help in cutting people. A lot of times I think cuts are more likely to occur from a punch kind of scraping off of somebody or just hitting very hard, but definitely that snap turnover, I think, is helpful. Uh, the whip of it, so it is kind of like a whip motion. So it's not just a pure turnover. I don't think that's sufficient to describe it. It is also a whipping type motion, which is again, think about it, and guys like uh, that had cutting like jabs, like Ali, he really kind of whipped it out there. And then you have the shoulder snap, snapping up that shoulder at the end of the jab, that again, creates that stiffness and that force at the end that we want, that leads us to the last point, the squeeze. You can do all the things in the first subcategory of the snap, right? Because again, at the end of the day, if you don't have a snap, with the other two things I'm going to talk about, it doesn't matter. Because if you don't have the snap, which, which encompasses also the squeeze, then you can do the two next things I'm going to talk about. It's not going to make a difference at all. I've just time and time again, I work with people. They'll do everything mechanically pretty optimal, but they lack this first thing. It doesn't matter. Someone gets his first thing down, they do everything else mechanically kind of like whatever, not quite exactly how I would say to do it. And they, they, they hurt you, all right? And then it comes to that squeeze at the end, right? For the last sub point, which helps facilitate all of that energy and all of that snap right on the end of the fist, the grabbing tight, which is going to create that jar. And now it, it makes your, your hand go from a floppy thing to a rock. And the tighter you grab at the end, not before, but just about right at the end, right about that point of contact, 
the more you are going to be hitting someone with a fistful of quarters and it's going to hurt them bad. All right. Now we got that part down. Work on that snap. Prioritize that snap because that's number one. Everything else doesn't matter. And I know it's a little bit backwards, maybe from maybe some ways some of you guys have heard to throw punches in the sense of getting the body behind the punch. All these things, yes, they're 100% important and we're going to talk about them. But you can have all of that. Miss this. Doesn't matter. All right. Now, the step with the jab, it's funny. You know, boxing, it's an art. So you hear a lot of people with a lot of different ideas on it. And that's cool. You know, everyone has good reasons for their different philosophies and theories on boxing. That's why, it, again, it, it is an art. It's not a pure science. It operates in the realm of physics, yes, and, and the natural world, yes. But um, there's a lot of interpretations, a lot of ways to get a job done. Uh, it's not like gravity where it's like, hey, if I pick something up and I, if I pick up this pen and I drop it, it's going to drop. <laughs> Unless we're somewhere else, like off the earth. All right. Now, the step. The step with the jab is so important. People like G. Ketty, the coach for Larry Holmes, talks about this. So many great coaches talk about this. And of course, I pale in comparison to any of them. But it is what I was taught as well. And it is what I go back to time and time again. Because going back to the, the cane to a blind man, that well, if, the, if you're too far away from the target, how are you going to get there? Are you going to lunge in with a punch? Or are you going to walk there before you jab? No, you need to use the jab as your entry most of the time. You can, you can step in with some other punches as well. And you can step in with some defense. You can step in with a slip. You can step in, just step it in. All right? But that foundation and that basic is so important. And we have to always go back to basics. We have to be able to enter the enemy territory with a nice lead, and that lead is the jab. So being able to step with the lead foot, obviously, not stepping with the heel of the foot, connecting with the ball of the foot first, and trying to time that as best we can with the extension of our arm, so we're not stepping first and then jabbing. We're disguising our step with the jab. Little do they know when they got popped in the face or defended the jab that we got just a little bit closer, all right? But then this also leads to power. That's why we're talking about it here, but it applies to everything. It leads to power because now we're putting our body behind the punch more, right? We could lean with the jab. We could absolutely lean with it, but this is a more intelligent way. We're going to create a little bit of power. We're going to create a lot of power, and we're going to keep ourselves more on balance. So now there's less openings that would happen if our habit is leaning. Now, again, you can show me countless videos of every single fighter in the history of boxing leaning. It's not going to kill you, but again, it's all about what you practice and what you strive for. Now, the rear foot, the rear foot coming up behind you, that's an important point, which is oftentimes left out. A lot of times with boxing, the jab is th thought mostly as that fencer type strike where you, you lunge in, lunge out, right? So therefore the, therefore, the rear foot gets left behind a lot of times. Now, that's, that's a strategy. That's a tactic. That's a style. That's a way to do it. But here's another way that also leads to more options. Yes, great to jab in and out with the lead foot only, leaving the rear foot behind you as you're, you know, you got one foot out the back door. Understandable. Now, also, sometimes, though, you need to shoot that jab and bring that back foot with you, and not just with the right hand or the two, or not just with another jab, but just with that single jab, because it's also going to lead you to more power. And then, instead of bouncing back to where your lead foot, your rear foot rather, was left, you can step over to the side or progress and continue to pressure forward. It's what I've seen different fighters struggle with that I've worked with. They'll get stuck on stepping with the lead foot, leaving the rear foot behind them, and they'll pop someone nice with a jab, snap their head up in the air, the person falls back a little bit, and now... They're stuck for a moment until that rear foot comes up behind them versus the person who gets that rear foot coming up behind them that does the same thing to their opponent. And then now they're just that little bit closer. And right from that position, they can step again or attack with anything they want. All right. But then it also leads to more power. Your leg is heavy. Your leg is so heavy. So leaving one leg behind is leaving some of your weight, some of your power, 
Let's not forget that. You know, it's funny uh, because, you know, since I rolled my location that I've had for over a decade that's been pure boxing into X3 Sports Athens and with the larger X3 company here in uh, Georgia, that, you know, I have a lot of, and always, you know, have, have been fond of other combat sports like Muay Thai and everything else. And it's so funny because, you know, I realized I haven't been kicked that much, uh, if, if really ever. And, you know, I had the body pad on working with some of my fighters. And I had one of the Muay Thai coaches, hey, you know, kick me in the stomach with the body pad on. You know, just uh, a, rear lay, a rear kick. And, man, this guy's not that big. And his, his punch, punching my stomach with, that, with, with his punch at his size, I wouldn't probably feel it very much with that body pad at all. But his leg, boom. Man, that was that was as hard as a guy that had thirty pounds on him would throw his hardest punch. But so this applies to our, our our punch with the step, because that that one leg you're leaving is so so heavy and helpful. Now number three, the twist. This is this is a tactic as well. Now this is interesting. I I, le I left it for last because I didn't want to neglect mentioning mentioning it because it is helpful. It is important. And it is absolutely the way we make power in a, in a safe way, in a fine way, and in an effective way. But I want to leave it for last. Here's the reason I want to leave it for last. Of course, the number one reason, the snap, like I talked about, you can do the step and the twist or whatever. And if you don't, you don't snap it, you don't grab tight at the end, it doesn't matter, right? It's, if you hit someone with, a, with a, a, a hand that is not a clenched fist, that you're not going to have the same power with a jab, specifically style punch, than if you squeeze tight at the end. Now, some people, this is how they learn the jab, is with the twist, all right? So you got some people the philosophy of the twist, some people the philosophy of the step. The vast majority of great boxers, the philosophy of the step is what is paramount and mostly used. Not to say doesn't, no one ever uses the twist, because that's why we're talking about it. Uh, the twist is a way you can throw a stationary, powerful jab, okay? Typically a single jab, right? Typically a single. And so that's where I see it sometimes be a detriment to people when they only learn how to twist their shoulders with the jab because then it makes their double slower. And it also leads to a slower jab in general because think about in order to accomplish the twist, you have to be a little bit more square. If you're a little bit more square, the jab isn't quite as close to the person. And, you know, this, that, and the other thing. The doubles and triples aren't going to be as fast, et cetera, because you're twisting, 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 right? It's just more time when you're twisting. But it's a great way. I remember my dad told me about, you know, fighters up in Chicago would be up, maybe up against a rope or just standing right there and you try to come in on them and they're just standing right there, a little bit open shoulder, turn the body hard, twist and snap that jab with a lot of power, right? It's also effective after a two. So let's say you're orthodox, you shoot a right hand straight and then you rotate back with that jab instead of a hook. It's a punch that's going to catch a lot of people because they expect the hook, but also it's going to make a nice, powerful shot. And then also off of a slip to the lead side, you slip to the lead side, you know, past somebody's right hand or to the inside of their jab, and you come back with your own jab, side yourself up as you jab, and that twist creates some great power, right? So there's another way to do it, three great ways. Now, six jab exercises. Here we go, guys, getting into it. Now, six jab exercises. The first is shadow boxing. Like, duh. Okay, but I'm sorry, I got to say it because I don't care how boring and how mundane it is or how mundane it sounds. I'm here to tell you the truth and what's important, <laughs> right? Not some flashy crap about some mechanism you could buy online that will make you better. The stuff that will actually make you better. And sometimes that stuff's pretty basic. But just shadow boxing your jab, guys, number one. All right? Now, I promise you all the other five are not. The rest of the six are not just going to be shadow boxing. <laughs> but number one. Backhand drill. All right? Did a video about this a long time ago. First, working on jabbing and extending the arm out and not turning over the fist with an open hand to get the feel of not flaring the elbow out. Because what we do oftentimes in, with trying to turn the fist over will start flaring the elbow and chick chicken wigging out real bad. And that takes off some of the effectiveness of the jab, also leads us more open to the body with the jab. Also, I would argue, wears out your shoulder more too. So working first with backhand hits 
uh, while keeping the elbow in. And then as you get that down, then you can quickly then start incorporating the slight turnover at the end and the snap and then put the whole shoulder snap and everything else behind it. And it's a brilliant way to create a very fast and effective jab that can also be doubled, tripled, and quadrupled up. Now, band hand or a, a band for your hand, right? So many ways to do this. You could, you could have a band in both hands wrapped around you. I have one that's just in one hand uh, tied to the ring behind me. But this helps you with that start speed. The reason why a band is effective, and again, to be clear, this is a drill to help increase your start speed uh, and just the velocity of the jab itself. Very important though, when you hold the band, that you're not squeezing the handle tight, right? Or if you have it wrapped around your hand or connected to your wrist in some fashion, obviously, make sure you have that open hand or relaxed hand as much as possible so you can not build up the habit of keeping a tight fist and nullifying that important number one point of the snap. And, uh, but the reason why bands are important is because if you try to do the same thing for the purpose of increasing speed and power with a dumbbell, you are going to spend a portion of that extension of your arm decelerating, not accelerating. Where a band, it gets tighter as you extend. So therefore it gets more weight and there's more resistance, which helps your uh, antagonist muscles not contract and slow down the extension. So this is why bands are a great and important way to build up speed, snap, etc., cetera, uh, and starting speed. Because unlike a dumbbell, where you have to spend a part of that extension decelerating, right, so you don't just hyperextend your elbow, the band tightens up for you, all right? So this is a great way to build that and a very effective tool. I've seen people, I've seen an old guy, they used to help me with strength and conditioning when I box. An old guy being from being go from being slow as dirt to being really fast, and he did it just with this method alone. Waistband. This is a great one as well. Putting the band around your waist to help you with that push off of the back leg and snapping with the feet. This is what's going to help you build up that speed and effectiveness outside of shadow boxing, of course, uh, to getting quickly with that jab to take those snappy steps steps required to have an excellent jab. Then wall drill, a great basic way, most of you guys know, to help minimize the elbow flare. Uh, more of like a, a, a newer person drill, right? Probably most advanced people don't need this that much, but you might. Just look out for it with your shadow boxing. And then this last one is for endurance. Okay, it's not for speed, it's not for power, it's for endurance, because we do need endurance. And I might have been remiss in talking about how the jab is the most ener energy inexpensive punch we can throw, right? Now, we need to build up shoulder endurance, obviously, because the shoulder is a muscle involved in the extension of the jab or extension of the arm to do a jab. But this drill is very effective with building up all three heads of the shoulder because instead of like a, a lateral raise, or a front raise, or reverse flies. Reverse fly is probably the best one uh, because everything else gets worked so much in boxing that we need to strengthen and, and build up, you know, just basically muscular endurance and some level of strength without overly degrading the, uh, the fibers and breaking them down too much because we're doing that enough when we box. But doing small dumbbell presses like this rapidly with relatively light weight over a minute, two minutes, for multiple sets at the end of your workout is a great way to help you with your shoulder endurance. Now, like I said, shoulder endurance, because you are spending a part of this movement decelerating, and therefore you do it at the end of your workout, not when you're trying to prime for speed and maximum motor recruitment in the shortest amount of time possible. This is again to build up the endurance in those muscle fibers so you can keep jabbing all night long. But this leads me to the, to the item, jumping back to the first thing about the energy expenditure. If we have our shoulder tight at all, when we're not jabbing, the jab's gonna cost more energy and it's gonna burn out your shoulder more. Obviously, jabbing can burn out your shoulder no matter how loose and nice you do it, but it is going to minimize how much that happens the more your shoulder relaxes in between jabs and does not get overly contracted. There's so many muscles and that's why it's so important to, as a great boxer 
to be loose. If you get loose, you go to the top. Watch that video that I did on how to be loose and how when you get loose, you go to the top. I'll do my best to remember to put that in the description below as well. But the more we learn to do that, like when I have had some boxers overcome any type of tension they have, all of a sudden all their shoulder problems go away because the muscles are just getting overworked and strained from t unnecessary tension. Um, but then for myself, all my shoulder injuries largely disappeared when I learned how to relax and be completely relaxed as I was throwing punches and only snap at the end of the punch. Uh, and my, my endurance shot up, everything shot up because you can be a world-class marathoner and burn the hell out of your shoulders and get arm weary and fall apart in one round of boxing, not because you're not in aerobic conditioning, but not because you, you don't have the ability to perform you know, three, three minute rounds, let's say, but because of the tension, right? Just like the person swimming that swims tight, they, they're going to burn out so hard. And yeah, it's a great workout, but in terms of effectiveness of trying to get somewhere with a swim or trying to last, like we are trying to last in the ring and be victorious, it's going to be a large detriment. All right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you click like, click subscribe, join level two. Like I said, I'm only accepting 10 more people, so I don't just overload the amount of people I work with uh, to review sparring, uh, fight video, training video, and give you tips in video form just like this to help you get to the next level. Already, it's already been very beneficial for a lot of people. Uh, and then also, coffee keeps me going. And like I said, coffee is my love language. Buy me a cup of coffee. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not an expensive date, but man, oh, some good coffee, some espresso, some whatever. Get me a couple cups, maybe, maybe a gallon, and really appreciate it, guys. All right? And you can do that by clicking the thanks. I'll see you guys on the next video. By the way, check out these videos over here uh, to dive deeper into different boxing concepts.